My name is Matt Galloway. I'm the host of Metro Morning on CBC Radio right across the street there. And um, delighted to have you here as part of this festival on snowy Santa Claus Parade Sunday. Um, we have a great guest with us um, who has been involved in helping to shape many of the conversations that we have been having on the radio for the last couple of years and that people have been talking about in this city and beyond for the last couple of years. Robin Doolittle, Doolittle you know, as an investigative reporter with the Globe and Mail, uh, did some great work there, did some great work at the Toronto Star as well, documenting the Rob Ford story, the story of City Hall, the story of what was going on in the city over the last few years and where the city will go from here. That work gained worldwide attention in her book, Crazy Town, The Rob Ford Story. I was on a plane flying into Russia um, almost a year ago and was reading the book and somebody beside me, a journalist from the Netherlands, wanted the copy of it and then the guy behind him wanted the copy of it. The people in front of me wanted the copy of the book. To the Indigo site. I did indeed, okay, yes, great. so they could get it. This is a story that people have uh, been following all around the world and it's largely because of her. Say hello if you would to Robin Doolittle. Thanks for coming. Thank you for being here. I was in Montreal this weekend, and um, for the first time in a long time, people, when they were talking to me, were not talking about Rob Ford. <laughs> it seems like we are back to sleepy old Toronto. Do you miss the city of the last few years and what we went through? Uh, no, definitely not. It, it's a weird time for me um, when the election was over and kind of going, okay, this this period of my life is, is over. And, and also as a citizen of Toronto saying that that period of our lives are over. Um, it's been really interesting watching John Tory and uh, just thinking, you know, these are these back to the boring old press conferences where no one's going to swear or accuse anyone of needing psychiatric help. Um, but in the, at the end of the day, that's obviously a, a good thing. This story is so familiar now to so many people. When did you realize, when did you first realize that you had something? That there was something here that uh, perhaps would be bigger than you possibly imagined, but that you had something? It, it came in a couple of phases. Um, in 2011, Rob Ford stopped showing up for work. And when you're a City Hall beat reporter, that, that's a, a tricky situation because you're supposed to be following the mayor. And, and people, I remember, you, they would say to you, well, how can you not know where he is? Um, sometimes you do stories and you, you call other municipalities around the country and in the states for that matter and you say, oh, well, what, does, what does this city do? How does this city handle things? And you speak with, with press people in those offices and um, they get wind of the fact that you don't get an agenda from the mayor's office every day and like, they are just so perplexed by that concept. Um, so early on it was kind of like, where is he? And that's when I started to hear about domestic incidents at his home. And that seems sort of tame now after all that we went through, but at the time it was like, wow, the cops are coming to Rob Ford's home on a pretty regular basis because of perhaps alcohol issues. And so that was kind of the first wave. And then obviously the, um, the, the rumor that went around that he would, had been snorting cocaine in the back of a downtown bar. Um, and that came in early 2012. So this was all well before crack came up, but, but around the time that we were talking about cocaine for the first time when, was when I was thinking like this could be very big. People use the word unbelievable a lot to describe the story. When did you start to believe those rumors and believe that this actually was happening? Because again, to a lot of people, this is beyond imagination. The mayor of the biggest city in the country involved in this sort of stuff. Um, that also came in waves. I mean, when I started to look into the, trying to, to figure out, okay, was he in fact snorting cocaine in the back of a crowded bar on St. Patrick's Day? Um, really early on, it became apparent that that was not going to be easy to nail down. There, the, I, I did track down the individual who walked in on him and he never saw any powder. Um, it was more of a feeling because of how he was acting. Uh, but it became clear that he at least had a very severe alcohol problem. And I felt pretty sure of that throughout most of 2012. I didn't, in my, I guess, when I, when I saw the crack video in 2013, I, I knew what I would be seeing. Um, I believed the individuals, what they were going to tell me was on it, but to see it with my own eyes, that was kind of the moment when I was like, okay, this is, this is real, this changes everything. As a journalist, what is it like to be in that moment? Uh, at that particular moment, I was I was afraid not about um, 
not about the actual circumstances I was in, but I was just thinking, I don't know how we're going to report this story. And that was a really tricky feeling because it's like, oh my God, I can see this video. Rob Ford has still actually not said he was smoking crack in the first video, so I should clarify that these are allegations. He is smoking a crack pipe and looks high on crack, so, but anyway. Um, in that moment going, oh my God, this is real. He's making homophobic and racial slurs. He's smoking out of a crack pipe. We're not, I know we're not gonna buy this for $100,000. How are we going to tell people about this? Like, am I going to retire from journalism having reported on the Ford administration and never actually told the real story of what was going on? And that was a, a very scary feeling. How were you empowered by the people that you worked with as a journalist and worked for to keep chasing that story? A story that a lot of people didn't believe, a story that, as you said, was really difficult and hard to try and get out there. How, how did that architecture around you sort of support you and push you forward? Uh, and and I, I was incredibly, I, I mean, I know I work at the Globe and Mail now, um, and, I, and I love my job there, and I, the Glo Globe has been wonderful in continuing to pursue this story. The Star, though, deserves a tremendous amount of credit uh, for what it did in those days. They gave me like really a full year of rope, like go out. I mean, I was still covering the daily grind at City Hall, but if I needed a couple days off here and there, or I'm gonna work one weekend and take a couple days off, or you know, just giving me that freedom to go chase these leads. Um, and then to have the guts to print them. I mean, everyone kind of does focus on, and I say this over and over again, but everyone does sort of focus on the crack video, but actually the first story, which is the story that I'm most proud of, and the story that I'm most proud of in my career is the story that he was asked to leave the Garrison Ball uh, because he'd showed up impaired, and also that his staff had wanted him to go to rehab because he had a drinking problem when it was affecting his work. That story took a tremendous amount of guts for the paper to run. Um, and gave full support no matter what came our way afterwards. What was it like to be told um, when that story came out that you were lying, that you were making it all up, that it wasn't true, there was no way that it was true because there were a number of people um, who, who went through you saying, it's impossible, this is not actually uh, the story that happened. What was that like? It, it was funny, when I was researching the book, I went around to, I, I interviewed basically everyone that had anything to do with City Hall to kind of com compile their views of, of the time and how it was unfolding. I, and I, a couple counselors uh, in particular stopped me, and Jay Robinson is the one that I include the anecdote in the book, and, and she was like, I just, I, I need to apologize. I know this is a year ago, and I didn't even say anything at the time, but I didn't believe you. I thought you were lying about the garrison ball. Um, I thought you were lying about all of that. And it seems so silly now, and I'm embarrassed about it, but I, I'm sorry. And I get those emails still to this day. Um, at the time, it was just, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. I guess I didn't believe it. I, I, I kind of thought, there's no way people can not believe this is true, that a paper, a new, especially when the crack video came around, the newspaper would make this up. I remember being out, I was out at a pub with some journalism people, from the star at the time, and the table next to me was talking about me and the story. They didn't realize, like, they, you know, you just know someone's name, you don't necessarily know what they look like. Um, and uh, they were like, I just think she's making it up. Like, why, you know, like, he's not, there's no way he's doing this. And I got up from the table and went and sat down, and I was like, I'm sorry, I just need to ask you, like, why do you think the star is making this story up? They didn't really have an answer. And then they finally were like, oh, are you Robin? Oh, maybe, maybe it's true, I don't know. You write about this in the book, though, this idea that um, we live in a time where people don't see something, they don't believe it. I mean, what does that do um, to a newspaper or to the media if you can't, because you saw the video, we should believe you because you saw it, but there are a lot of people who say, well, if I don't see it, then it doesn't exist. I think in terms of long-lasting legacy out of this period and this time, um, I would hope that there is sort of a renewed sense of trust in media after the Ford story. Um, I think that people kind of had a moment where it got really low. People were thinking, okay, this is possible that the, you know, the Toronto Star is making this story up and that kind of came through it. Um, but it is something that I will take with me going forward in my career. When I went to the Globe, in my first week that I was at the Globe and Mail, I got a, the call about the second crack video, which was a whole other example of this story. You couldn't make this up. Um, but it was weird because it was kind of like getting a, like a, a do-over. What, this is the same circumstance, what am I gonna do differently? And the one thing that I made very clear with, with the editors and everyone was very supportive of this is, 
we need to get a screenshot at least of this. Like that, no matter, I don't think, we, we don't necessarily need to buy this video, but we need a screenshot. We need something to show people. And I do not, I personally don't believe that Ford would have went to rehab if we didn't get that photo of him holding a craft pipe and run it on the front page of the Globe and Mail. In all of this, um, what was the strangest moment for you? The thing that, that you will remember 30 years down the road about being involved in this story? What was the strangest, the one strangest thing? Uh, tragically, I think, I mean, his cancer diagnosis um, and the fact that he had to withdraw just days before the cutoff. That, I mean, in all of the crazy, horrible twists and turns in this story, that that would happen. I mean, the so Crazy Town has been optioned for a movie and they're, they're writing the script now. Um, and it was like, if you were right, if you were making this up, you would not think that that is possible, that that could not be believed. So something about this, this story that is truly stranger than fiction. If you had the chance to talk to him, to interview, what would you ask him? Um, because you want, you want I mean, it's, it's so tricky now. I mean, uh, he just really needs to focus on his health. But the one question that I've always wanted to know from Rob Ford, um, when I, when I picture Toronto, I picture a streetcar kind of rumbling down the street. I picture picnics in Trinity Bellwoods, um, you know, a, a Raptors game, the Flatiron Building and the Esplanade. I, I just, I've always wondered, like, what does Rob Ford, when he thinks of Toronto, what does he picture? What is the city that he, that like holds dear in his heart? And I, I'm not sure I know that. And I think that that's kind of interesting. Why, why of all the things you could ask him, you could ask why he smoked crack or what do you mean? Why of all of the things is that so interesting to you? Um, I guess because I, at this point, I don't, this sounds awful, I don't know if I care for his reasons about why he was smoking crack. Um, you know, we, we've come, it, it kind of always comes, does come down to this, this matter of public interest. You know, two years ago, I would have had a different question to ask Rob for. Um, but at this point, I think we have a pretty good understanding. This is a, a he was a man with an addiction. Um, he had this this really challenging upbringing. He gets to this this point in his career. He's now the mayor of the city. For right or wrong, he thought he was pursuing a, a path. Um, and, and I'm not sure why he was doing that. That's, I guess, the, what I mean by what he pictures in Toronto. Like, what is the city that he was trying to create? That's what I don't understand about him. The drugs and everything else, I, I, I can kind of get. Tell me something about Rob Ford that perhaps we don't know. I mean, he's, he's this larger-than-life character, and people think that they know a lot about his life. You have had the chance to examine so much about him. What is something perhaps that would surprise people about Ford or that, that perhaps we don't know about him? Hmm. Uh, he's very shy. I think that that's something that people, what, this is an odd thing. One of the most common questions I get from people is, have you ever spoken to Rob Ford? I do kind of want to throttle people when they ask me that, but um, it's like, yes, I have spoken with Rob Ford. But uh, he's not a, He's not someone you're going to sit down and have a conversation with, like a back and forth. You can ask him something and he might answer, or he might, you know, have a prepared statement and ramble off his head. But he is a he is a, a shy person, and he seems insecure a lot of the time. Um, so that that is something I think people don't know. He also has allergies, which I learned from his DUI report in the states, which I thought was interesting. American access law, uh, access to any information in the states is is much better. So. Um, when I was when I was researching for the book and went to Florida to pull his his records, um, it's extremely detailed what what I was able to get, and there was a lot of personal information in that. What is his legacy going to be on, on the city? I mean, what what will the city remember of Ford? I, I think the the one thing that Rob Ford did that was very good, um, he really is credited with uh, reigning in <laughs> expression, but. Uh, expenses in terms of um, city councillors and what they're expensing on their expense accounts. Like that was Rob Ford in the early, it was when he was a councillor and he was the first one to really say like, how do you explain this? Like why is this a benefit to the taxpayer? Um, and whether you like the word taxpayer or citizen, like leave that aside. Um, he was posting this stuff to his website. He had his own personal website and was posting expenses. Um, and it was because of a lot of his pushing 
uh, that the city passed a lot of reforms in that area. So that is one thing, I think, his lasting legacy as a city official. As mayor, I think he made it, um, he made areas within the bureaucracy think long and hard about how am I going to explain this purchase? And that's not a bad thing for, for any public sector to really think about is how is this going to look to be afraid of, of wasting money. That, that is a Rob Ford legacy. Olivia Chow, when she was running for mayor, was talking about, was talking the, the Rob Ford talk when it came to money. How much damage did he do to the city, do you think? I, I think, um, I, I think because of the outcome, he did no damage. In, in terms of, we had a, a moment that as a city, we, we had to think, like, where do we want to go? Do we want to go this way, or do we want to go that way? Um, because he lost his powers so early on, like before council stripped him of his powers, Rob Ford was very marginalized at City Hall. It was really just 2011 where he was pushing things through. By the time the, the waterfront hijacking came along, the centrist councillors kind of pulled together and said, wait a minute. And, and at City Council, he lost a lot of his leverage really early. Um, but I think the fact that the city went through that, people are so engaged. It always surprises me when I'm walking down the street and I hear people talking about city council. Like people, the average person can probably name more than 10 city councillors, which is kind of incredible when you think back to the pre-Ford era. Could that have happened? So where are we now um, post-Ford? I mean, he's still a councillor, or will be a councillor when they're all sworn in. But where are we now as a city, do you think? I'm really curious uh, how John Tory does. I'm really curious how the, how city council is going to deal with him. Our, our city council, I know what, what I hope is that city councillors really try their best to come to compromises on things as opposed to kind of digging in in the way that the Miller years were, which really set up the situation that led to Rob Ford. Um, I, I really hope that people kind of look at what happened with the whole Ford train, how, wh where that fuel came from, where that gas came from, and it came from these deep divisions and rhetoric and us versus them, um, and, and you know, John Tory does have a resume of, of bringing different people together and different groups together, and maybe he's more right wing than some people care for, but he is the mayor, and, and to see if people work with him or, or how, they, how they deal with the fallout from the Ford era. I'm also really interested to see how, if Rob Ford's at City Council, I mean, to have a, a former mayor in the chamber is going to be very challenging for, for Tory, I think. Is he going to be the same Rob Ford, do you think? It, 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 will he be the, the, the Rob Ford councillor of old who votes against many things and is known for, as you said, standing up and saying, how are you going to explain to the taxpayers why this money is being spent here? Or yeah. has he changed, do you think? No, I think he's going to be even more emboldened. Like you can just imagine Rob Ford standing up and saying, you know, when I was mayor, we contracted out, Gar when I was mayor, we saved a billion dollars and you're doing X, Y, Z. Um, I think he's going to be campaigning for the mayoral job right from his first day as, back as a city councillor. Really? Uh, yeah, I do. I'll put $5 on it. $5? Five? That's a latte. Latte sipping downtown. Downtown of the yeah. uh, We have time for some questions, but I want to ask you one more question, and this is not about Rob Ford, it's about Doug Ford. What do you make of Doug Ford? Oh, Doug Ford. I'm almost, you know, like in the last, since I've been at the Globe, I've really been focusing a lot on Doug. Um, and, and, and Crazy Town, for that matter, focuses a lot on Doug, because to me, they are so linked. Um, and the whole, and, and I've been focusing on Deco, their company, and what it means, and trying to figure out, like, would Doug actually go back to a life of labels after this? Or is, does he, has he caught the political bug in the spotlight and wants to be a power broker? And I, I, I can't imagine that he's going to step away from that. I, I think if he has a path to the PC leadership, he will try to take it. Um, Will he run for, I mean, what's interesting is both the Ford brothers have said that they're not really now run, running for mayor in 2018, which people, is... People often said that he was Rob Ford's, you know, better brain, essentially, that they were, you know, twin mayors, but that he was the brains behind the operation. Is that fair to say? He's certainly more analytical and logical than Rob Ford. City uh, bureaucrats that I've spoken with said, you know, Doug is far from perfect, but at least in the early days, you could reason with him. 
Um, and he was the one that was meeting with the city manager and um, the deputy managers trying to figure out how to handle this. So he, he doesn't have Rob's charisma and connection to the people. Connection to the people, what a phrase. He doesn't have that ability to connect with people. Uh, he doesn't seem as authentic as Rob, but he is probably a better businessman. Last question just before we get to audience questions, which is there are a lot of people who say that some of the uh, issues that you've been raising at the Globe around influence that he and his company uh, may have had at City Hall or the connections that he was trying to uh, bring in between friends and family members uh, at the city, that that is actually even more important than a mayor smoking crack. Would you say that? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean... whiff of, not corruption, but, but you know... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, I'm more interested in the idea that he was hanging out with alleged gang members and smoking crack. But, like, once that's out of the way... Yeah, I, uh, Greg MacArthur and I at The Globe have been really taking a lot of time and looking at deco labels and how the Fords have the overlap between deco's clients and city business and we've uncovered a multitude of examples where there are at least very real questions about um, whether the Fords were using their influence to gain business at deco or trying to gain business at deco or doing favors for clients of deco they say not just to be fair to them um, but it's now a matter of a, of a court challenge, it's mul multiple integrity commissioner investigations. Uh, and absolutely, I, I think at this point, the, those are incredibly important and hard-hitting stories. Any questions for Robin Doolittle? If you have, you can put your hand up and there's microphones that will get to you. Go ahead. Um, where do you think the Toronto Police investigation, which I think is called Project Traveler, where do you think that's going to squirt out? Um, so it started with Project Traveler and then it was a spiral off of that that they took Traveler and made it Project Brazen 2. Um, I think some people, for right or wrong, don't understand as clearly that the police also have to deal with politics um, and optics. And I think, I'm just guessing here, they're all, it's still going. The investigation is still moving along. They're still investigating the situation. But would you really lay a charge with a man who has been beaten down so far at this point and is having kind of a, a fight of his life with cancer. I, I, I can't see that happening, to be honest. Thanks. Question here at the front. Rob's family was never really talked about at all during everything. I'm wondering if you think that that was mostly his doing or theirs in terms of keeping them very much in the background. Uh, so the question was about why Rob Ford's uh, immediate family was not discussed a lot. Um, I know in my reporting, I, I always tried to avoid them. Um, I, in Crazy Town, I, um, I very rarely bring up any of the children. I, I pretty well have sidestepped Doug's children as well. Um, and, and when it came to a couple matters where his wife was involved, it was only if I felt that it was imperative to the narrative of the story. For instance, uh, a conversation she had with, with an individual after Rob was elect, um, elected in 2010 about him continuing to use cocaine and her warning him, you're gonna ruin your whole life, people are gonna find out and him going anyway. Um, but for the most part, I think that they're not elected officials. They deserve their private life. They didn't ask to be in the spotlight. Do you feel sorry for him? I, I, I don't know, that's kind of, it's a tricky question. I don't well, you know if I even want to go there. <laughs> Do you feel sorry for her? <laughs> she, I mean, when they got married, I'm sure she was not thinking this was where life would take her. Fair enough. It's Robin Doolittle. Uh, thank you very much for all of your questions and your attention. She's going to be signing books. There, right over there. Uh, and you can purchase a copy of the book, Crazy Town. Purchase many copies. Holidays coming up. Yep. Get her to sign them, present. personalize them. And coming up next on this stage, it's how a picture book is made. That's going to start in about five minutes. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt.